Hello and welcome to the Think Big series, a collection of dialogues with leading speakers brought to you by PSG. I'm Alicia Seckham. To our viewers today, please note that this is a pre-recorded session recorded prior to the sitting of the South African Reserve Bank's MPC this week because our guest this week is Deputy Reserve Bank Governor Kuben Naidu. So cognizant of the Saab's lock-in period, we've refrained from venturing into any talk around inflation, any talk around the current interest rate environment, and instead we're getting into the realm of blockchain technology. It emerged in 2009 as, of course, the underlying technology of Bitcoin, which is now but one of the digital currencies known as cryptocurrency and the growth we've seen in the space has been staggering. But as much as the highs, extensive highs, there have been lows, extreme lows. And it's hard to deny that the crypto market has taken on a life of its own. The South African Reserve Bank is, of course, amongst those keeping a keen eye on the evolution of crypto assets. And when it comes to its position on virtual currencies, well, shifts have been afoot. So joining me now is Saab Deputy Governor and member of the Monetary Policy Committee, Kuber Naidu, who oversees the financial stability and currency cluster. So thanks, Kuber, for joining us. Like I say, a lot's changed over the years since 2009, since 2014, when the Saab's first position paper on virtual currencies was laid out since 2018, when we saw some revision emerge, so much so that there's now again strong recognition that the Saab needs to shift its stance on the supervision and regulation of crypto assets. Still, I've got to ask you right at the top, is South Africa not behind the curve on this one? No, I don't believe we're behind the curve. You know, I think that uh, we pretty much smack bang in the middle of what most uh, central banks are doing, what most regulators are doing. We follow pretty closely what uh, advanced economies are doing. So that the UK, Singapore, Australia tend to lead on the technology front. We're watching them very closely. Uh, but uh, no, I don't believe that we, we're behind the curve. Um, I, I think there was a lot of hype. A lot of that hype has disappeared. And now most central banks are focused on two things. One is regulating the broad crypto environment, but also learning from it and seeing how it can take on board some of those lessons. I asked the question, Kaven, because there's been a criticism of policy stagnation in a space that's more than just peaked interest. You know, there's been the snowballing without regulation as it continues to attract huge amounts of capital and investment. Surely this is now no longer just hype. It's no longer just a fad and has moved beyond those looking to make a quick buck. Or, or lose a quick buck. I mean, if you'd bought two months ago at $40,000 uh, a certain coin, uh, you would have lost more than half your money. Um, you've got to distill the technological advancements, which are really positive. Um, some of the potential improvements to the payment system, which is really exciting from the hype. And there is a lot of hype. And, and you've got to distill those three. Um, you, you can't confuse them. You know, let me take you a little bit on a journey. So five, six years ago, our general view to crypto is, well, interesting, let's look at the technology, but you know, we're not really interested in regulating this. I mean, Alicia, if you'd like to keep your assets in, cap in cattle, that's your business, right? You've got a very nice painting there behind you. If you want to keep your assets in, in painting, that's pretty okay. You could, uh, you know, you could pay your son's lobola using cattle. That's your business, right? The central bank doesn't get involved. You could trade that uh, painting behind you for a couch. That's your business. Central bank doesn't get involved. Um, so why should we get involved in crypto, right? And and it 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 led to the question: Is 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 this a currency? And by all definitions, it's not a currency. It's an asset. Um, it's something that is tradable. It's something that is created. Some of it has backing, some doesn't. Some may have a genuine underpinning uh, by a real economic activity, some doesn't. And so our view initially, certainly five, six years ago, was, well, we're watching this. We worried about some of the money laundering issues. We worried about some of the exchange control issues, perhaps the tax issues. But we're not intent on regulating this from a currency point of view because it's not a currency. You can't really trade on it. You can't really go to the shop and buy something. Our view has changed. Our thinking has changed in that regard. 
we now do regard it as a financial asset and we hope to regulate it as a financial asset. Um, I, I'm happy to spell out in detail what that means, but you know, you're right, it didn't go away. You're right, there's a lot of money that's flowed in and there is a need to regulate it. There is a need to bring it into the, the mainstream uh, in yeah. an orderly fashion, but in a way that balances the excitement and the hype with the investor protection requirements that's critical. And Karen, you, you know, you hit the nail on the head there. I mean, you ask, of, you know, why this needs to be regulated and possibly because of the le level of activity we've seen in this space, despite it having been unregulated and the kind of risk that was involved nevertheless. In fact, the shift that we are seeing in stance from the Saab now coming through in part, as you say, as a result of South Africa having been hit by two scams already and that triggering a lot of concern about theft and about money laundering. Hmm. No, definitely. I mean, you know, the, between the Reserve Bank and the Financial Sector Conduct Authority, we investigating probably eight to 10 really big pyramid schemes a year. And, and this is like a 30 year old issue, right? I mean, some of the big ones was that sort of triple M, uh, you, you know, the share max issue you've got we are constantly investigating between ourselves and the Financial Sector Conduct Authority, we're investigating scams, pyramid schemes, Ponzi schemes, people ask to put their money in. And certainly for, for, for in some respects, you know, the crypto hype looked like this. In some respects, the crypto hype uh, bore all the hallmarks of a Ponzi scheme, of a pyramid scheme. Again, I think that there's some genuine excitement about the technology, there's some genuine potential in the payment space. And perhaps that's why we are looking at it more seriously and seeing if we can regulate it, if we can sift out the good apples from the bad apples and to create a, a, a regulated environment that's safer. Yeah, absolutely. Because without any regulatory framework, users, of course, uh, open themselves up to significant risk. As you've highlighted, you've got banks having become de facto uh, gatekeepers or regulators, if we can call them that. You know, so let's weigh up at this point, Kaben, the pros and cons, you know, from an investment perspective, because that's primarily where the activity is at. I don't want to back any horse from an investor perspective, right? An investment perspective. I mean, you know, again, the, the, if you had bought uh, the most popular crypto asset at $9,000 and it went up to $40,000, you went pretty well. You did pretty well. If you had bought it closer to 40,000 and it's now at 19 or 18, then you've lost your money. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, I sort of tell the story about four or five years ago, I went to a Christmas party, a family Christmas party, and one of my nephews said, you know, what, what do you think about crypto? And I said, you know, this is just hype. This is just a Ponzi scheme. It's going to collapse. So he says, no, so I've bought some. And, you know, I've taken Gran's money and I've also bought some. And I said, oh, you've taken my granny's money and you bought some crypto. You know, are you sure you're going to do well? I, I, please, you know, give Gran her money back. And so every subsequent family event, he came up to me and said, you know, I've done well, I've done really well. You were wrong, you were wrong. Um, I don't know what he's gonna say this December, um, but whether it goes up or down is not the, is not the question here, Alicia. I, the job of the central bank is not to pick winners and losers in an investment race, right? You know, if you'd bought Nasper shares 10 years ago, you would have made a hundred times your money. If you'd bought, um, you know, Apple shares 20 years ago, you would have made 100 times your money. Our job is not to pick winners or, or losers. Our job is to, to, to regulate something so that people have an adequate, what we call health warning, right? An adequate investor protection warning. And, and that, what, that, that is what we're trying to do. But just crypto is far too volatile for it to be used as a payment space. Okay. Okay, so so let's get to grips with things here, and we'll get to the uh, you know the the crypto being used as a currency in a bit. Before we get there, we've got this regulatory clock ticking because you know questions are raised. You know, the financial sector cannot price in for risks properly at this stage. Yeah. So, what are some of the headline considerations 
mm-hmm. that you're bearing in mind as the, this regulatory framework is built. First things first, it's got a center, Kuben, around you know creating a licensing regime, regulating the platforms so that the only risk the investor is taking is market risk, as you highlight, and they're not the criminal risk that seems to come uh, hand in hand right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, look, absolutely correctly. So we, we've got five very simple steps. The first is to declare a financial product. Right? That would allow us to list it as a schedule under the Financial Intelligence Center Act, the FIC Act. The second is to develop a regulatory framework for the exchanges or the platforms, as you say. And there would have to be KYC, fairly basic KYC, and they would have to comply with exchange control laws, tax laws, all the other laws. Right? And lastly, they would have to give a health warning. They would have to tell the people who buy the crypto assets that you could lose money, right? that this is not a bank deposit. It's not a bank. It is not a bank deposit. You could, you, you could lose money. Um, and and for, th- th- that's the most basic elements. All we that's all we want to do at this stage. We want to delete a financial product. The exchanges would have to comply with AML CFT rules, and they would have to su- submit suspicious transaction reports. If you are transacting across borders, um, you would have to comply with exchange control rules. So, in the absolute same instance, that painting that you have behind you has got no, with the South has got no regulations behind. But if you were to take it overseas and sell it, it would incur an exchange control issue, right? Um, in the exchange control manual, people often buy yachts in Cape Town and sell it to the Bahamas and sell it, right? And, and, and we have a regulatory framework. We cover racehorses in the regulatory framework. So you could breed a horse here and bring it, take it overseas and sell it. It's, it's a, you, you've got to comply with exchange control. Yeah. In the exact same way, if you take or trade in currency or in, 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 in dollars or euros or in, in rands across borders, you, you've got to comply with exchange control laws and, and crypto would fall into the same. So in that, and I, I want to just home in on exchange control regulation for a bit, because Kuben, when you listen to market chatter, you know, the sticking point is around uh, the exchange control regulations and the annual 1 million rand limitation on buying of crypto assets as it stands right now. What's the dynamic there? And are there um, mechanisms that would allow higher value transactions or investments being made locally while guarding against some of that uh, capital flight risk that you try and mitigate against? So, Alicia, if you were to take up to 1 million rand out of the country, we ask no questions, Mm -hmm. right? Um, we have a limit of 1 million rand for no questions asked. Right? You could send that as a gift to a friend. You could pay your kids school fees. Um, you know, you could go shopping, whatever. You, there, there's no questions asked. We don't ask you for any, any information from an exchange control point of view. If you are taking more than 1 million rand, you need to comply with fairly basic uh, 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 reporting requirements. And those reporting requirements are quite simple. You had, you, if you're a South African tax resident, you have to have a tax clearance certificate, right? And you have to show the source of the income. So if you can say, look, I've earned 5 million Rand this year. I would like to take out 2 million Rand. Here's my tax clearance certificate. Here's my paycheck. I have earned this legitimately. You can take out more than 1 million, right? Those are the only two requirements. Right. It's reported to the central bank, it's recorded, it's reported to the tax authorities, you need a tax clearance certificate, and you need a, a source of funds uh, statement. Right? You can take out as much as you want in that regard. Right? For investment purposes, there are limits. You can take out up to 10 million rand, no questions asked for investment purposes. But at the moment, crypto is not an investment product. Right? Um, so if you'd like to buy a flat in London, you can take out up to 10 million rand. No questions asked for investment purposes. Above that, again, you've got to demonstrate source of income and that you're tax compliant. Right? We've allowed people to take out billions of rands for investment purposes. Right? But you've got to ask for you've got to apply to the Exchange Control Department for permission, the Financial Surveillance Department for permission. So the exact same rules will apply to crypto. 
uh, th the same rules. And again, Alicia, we have gradually loosened these limits every year since I've been in government, since 95. Every year, we've made these, these rules less and less onerous. We've raised the limits, raised the limits. Um, so the same would apply to crypto, right? If you want to take out X amount, if it's below yeah. a million, there's nothing. If it's above a million, you need to show source of funds. Uh, and, and, and that's all that we want to do. We want to bring this into the mainstream in that, in that sense. Okay, so Kaben, as you make your assessments and you know structure your approach now to regulation uh, very systematically, you've invited public comment as well. So what's some of the feedback or the commentary you've received so far? Alicia, there's, um, you get lots of types of comments. So some people sort of accuse us of being Philistines and living in the dinosaur age. And, you know, they, they would like absolutely no rules and regulations. Most of the, the exchanges that we've spoken to welcome our approach. Most of them feel that they, it legitimizes the industry. It allows the good players in, it keeps the bad players out. It prevents money laundering and it provides a safe investment or a, 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 a transactional platform for, for people. So most of the industry welcome what we put down. There are quibbles about how we enforce those things. There are quibbles about the regulatory oversight that we'll impose. Uh, but in the main, most of the exchanges have welcomed what we've proposed. What about timing, Kaben? I mean, are things just progressing too slowly? We've seen uh, Nigeria being one of the first having issued a license uh, regime for crypto already. So how soon before we see the finalization of a framework here? You know, a clear regulatory licensing regime that will more clearly position valid crypto platforms within the financial mm -hmm. services landscape. Sure. Um, you're right, it's happening too slowly. The Minister of Finance first needs to amend Schedule 1 of the FIC Act to declare this a financial product. The Financial Sector Conduct Authority would have to develop the regulatory framework around licensing exchanges. Um, in the Reserve Bank, we are busy and we're quite close to finalizing the exchange control rules and requirements. And the FIC would have to uh, finalize the KYC rules, which I assume will be fairly basic proof of address and identity. Um, and these days you can do a lot of that remotely. You don't have to go into a branch. You don't have to uh, have a physical office or physical press pre presence. There are digital banks who do this entirely remotely. Uh, and, and as the FIC Act says, it, it, it should be risk-based. So, you know, I, I don't know what the timing is, but I'm hoping that we can do this step-by-step step, that once the ministers amended schedule one of the FIC Act, that we can begin to, to move. It will probably still take us around 12 to 18 months uh, to, to get all of our ducks in a row, get everything in place. Um, but I don't think that this has to happen in a big bang. I think we can start to have some KYC rules. We can start to yeah. license exchanges. We can start to get basic XCON information collected. Okay, and then progress to this, you know, target of 12 to 18 months out. Once that's in place, Kuben, what would be a viable user case scenario and what would be the potential rules of engagement here? Sure. Essentially, you'd be able to buy and sell crypto assets on the exchange, right? Um, can you trade using crypto assets? That's a different matter. Again, in South African law, there is nothing that stops you from swapping that painting for a couch. There's absolutely nothing in law. So if you'd like to transact within the South African borders using crypto assets, you know, I want to swap X amount of coins for, you know, a bicycle or whatever, you, you're free to do that, right? Um, it's the point at which you change your RANDs for crypto assets that you need to do the KYC. And on the other side, if you want to change the crypto assets to RANDs, you need to do, you, you need to do the regulatory stuff. But in the medium, in the middle of that, you're free to do that and as you please. Uh, but with risk. However you bind from overseas, right? Then it's a cross border. Then you would have to, as if you were doing it, you know, from Amazon or, um, you know, I, I, I tell the story sort of in lockdown, uh, I wanted to register for a pickling course by some housewife in India. And I had to pay 930 Rand to, to attend this two-day online pickling course. 
and the woman who was running the course didn't have point to sale terminal, so I had to do an EFT. It took me 10 days and about five pages of paperwork, right? And, and, and you know, this is RANS. Um, but, but, you know, similar, if you want to trade, trade across borders using crypto assets, there would be a very similar kind of, of regulatory environment. You can do it. We are not saying it's not allowed, but there has to be a, 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 a sense of reporting. Yeah. Are you keeping things very much, uh, you know, in their silos because of the threat this potentially poses uh, could be into the country's main currency? I mean, you were cited by a, Reut uh, by a, a Reuters saying that if crypto assets were to become a very ubiquitous currency, it could undermine the authority of the central bank. So have you seen signs of crypto devaluing fiat currency anywhere else in the world just yet? No, we, we, that, that is not a risk, right? That's not a big risk. So, of course, if crypto becomes ubiquitous, if everybody's using it, you know, the, the central bank is not the main issue of currency and we're not setting the interest rate at which people can get that currency. Of course, it would have implications for the monetary system. But, but there, no, there's no risk of that happening anywhere in the world today. But there is a significant risk on money laundering, right? And we, we have seen at least one very large scam being operated out of South Africa. We've seen many smaller scams and internationally, you know, when I talk to my US counterparts, they say that 90% of transactions in the US using crypto assets. I'm not talking about buying and selling for investment purposes. I'm talking about trans payment transactions, are either for opioids or in the gambling industry. Right? So they're either in the drugs or in the gambling industry where people want a degree of anonymity, right? I'm not saying that they're crooks. I'm not saying that they're stealing money, but most use cases for crypto globally in terms of has not been an honest one and not been a clean one, right? You've seen it being used as ransom in ransomware attacks or in kidnappings. Um, you've seen it being used in cross-border kidnappings. You've seen it being used in cross-border cyber attacks uh, so companies uh, uh, get cyber attacked and information stolen and people want crypto um, because they think it gives them a degree of auto anonymity yeah. uh, and, and and so it's harder to trace and and that's what we're trying to solve right so uh, and and i think that we've got a responsibility to the public to to, to enforce our aml cft rules and we've seen the hard the hard evidence when we don't do that properly yeah. Kuben, at the end of the day, long and short of this, you're looking at improving international banking, cross-border transactions for South Africa using this mechanism, not necessarily giving South Africans then, uh, you know, access to a digital currency for everyday use just yet. Okay, look, that's a different topic. That's what, you know, the issue about whether the central bank itself should issue a digital currency. Yeah. And we are experimenting. We are learning We've had two pilots. We've done. We've created a central bank digital currency in, in a test environment. The first was to buy and sell reserve bank bonds or paper or debentures, and the second was whether we could issue a token to the banks to trade in central bank money. Uh, so if they're buying and selling bonds from us, we give them a token, and then could they use the token to sell? Um, we are also part of something called Project Dunbar, which is a four country project led by Singapore, involving South Africa, Singapore, Malaysia and Australia for a cross border central bank digital currency. At the moment, we've, we've got two agendas. One is we want to improve the efficiency of our local payment system. We want to bring down costs and we want to bring down time that it takes to clear things in the local payment system. Maybe digital or distributed ledger technology or, or, or DLT can help in that, but maybe conventional technology may use. I'm not yet sure about the, that answer. But for international payments, we really do see inefficiency. For you to, if you're a migrant that wants to send money to Malawi or Mozambique, you're spending somewhere between 10 and 30% of your money spending. So there might be use cases in cross-border remittances that can bring down the costs of transacting, um, you know, and, and we're exploring that. Uh, I think the more likely first use for a central bank digital currency will probably be a regional one, 
probably be for cross-border payments, either for goods and services or for migrant remittances. But again, Alicia, I think we are a long way off from that. You know, I think we're probably several years away from, yeah. from that. Uh, and I think most central banks in the world are several years away from that. You know, we're partnering with some of the most advanced countries in the world on these experiments, these tests. We set up a fintech unit about five years ago uh, to learn about these things. You know, we, we've built several blockchains of our own now, uh, and we've transacted using relatively high volumes. Um, yeah. But it's not yet uh, anywhere near the case where we can introduce a digital, a central bank digital currency. Kuben, in the interim, is there room here to start talking about an AU currency regime? You know, you can't regulate the currencies themselves, but like you say, you can regulate the platforms, right? So then limit the coins on offer on the platform, the most liquid. Bitcoin, Ethereum, and then use that to facilitate African trade and cross-border transactions. And I talk in the context of, you know, looking to advance the African free trade agreement. Do you see any level of cooperation emerging on that front? Has something like this been discussed, uh, you know, with the Central Bank Governors Forum? So there's something called the AACB, the Association of African Central Banks and the African Union. They are talking about a regional uh, payment system, an African payment system. Um, and in SEDEC, we are talking to our SEDEC counterparts about a regional payment system. In fact, we hope to rewrite what's called the real-time growth settlement system, the SEDEC uh, real-time growth settlement system, uh, to, 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 to help make cross-border payments faster, more efficient, and at a lower cost. We might use distributed ledger technology. We might not, right? I, I don't yet know the answer to that. Distributed ledger technology has the advantage that it is easier to detect fraud. It has the advantage that it is lower risk when it comes to audit trails. It does have the disadvantage that it is significantly slower. Right? It's also significantly more energy intensive. Right? And, and those are two significant disadvantages. Perhaps the technology will get better over time and, and you know, we, we, we can look at that. But you know, you, you're now looking at about, if I take Bitcoin, you're looking at about seven transactions a second, which is much faster than five years ago, but still relatively slow, right? Um, in South Africa, Visa and MasterCard or your bank card or bank serve process hundreds of thousands of transactions a second. Um, and, and so because of the extra verification that distributed ledger technology requires, it is slower. Again, you're trading one type of security for, for another. And, and, you know, I think we'll have to continue learning, continue seeing if the technology makes sense. Because it is our ultimate objective to, to improve the payment system, yeah. to make it more competitive, to bring down costs, and to make it cheaper. Like, uh, you know, I asked that question because we've had what the Central African Republic uh, seeing Bitcoin now is legal tender and it got the rumor mills turning. Could they want to push a single Africa currency in the long term? So that's sprouting that idea. Uh, having said that, Kuben, there are a host of countries, like you say, introducing e-versions of their traditional currency, you know, and studying how the underlying technology could be used. We've got China's digital yuan pro uh, project that's the most advanced amongst the large economies. Uh, last year, Nigeria Central Bank introducing e-Naira uh, for use of, by ordinary citizens as well. So what are some of the lessons already being extracted from sure. those experiences? Sure, thanks. If we, were, if we had a really bad, inefficient, old, archaic payment system, and if I were to build a new payment system, I'd probably use a distributed ledger technology. I'll probably build it on a, on a central bank digital currency platform, right? If you've already got a very fast, efficient payment system, if you've got a pretty ubiquitous payment system, it reaches everyone and everything and is relatively efficient, I would focus not on the architecture, but on improving the efficiency thereof. So the Central African Republic doesn't have a payment system, right? They don't have a currency. So, you know, it makes sense for them to consider this. Yeah. Um, Nigeria's payment system is not as fast and as efficient as South Africa. And so they are leapfrogging stages of development and that's a really good thing for them. 
Okay. So so there's no we're risk of same, us as South same. Africa being left behind and losing some uh, first to market competitive advantage here where others are already able to leverage off the benefits that can be derived, like, uh, you know, promoting financial inclusion at a low cost and then facilitating things like uh, social grant disbursements, for example. So Brazil has done that during COVID. Brazil introduced an e-wallet and they were able to pay grants to, I forget the numbers, around 40 million people or something like that. Um, and then these people can now transact using their phones. Um, so it's just a phone and an identity number. Uh, and literally in a very short space of time, I mean, just under a year starting in 2020, Brazil was able to introduce e-money um, and people can transact in this. Are we being left behind? No. Right. We, we, by international standards, we've got a very good payment system. Right? By international standards, you know, if you include all the elements of the payment system, including things like mobile money and e-wallets and Apple Pay and Zapper and SnapScan, and or if you introduce all of those sorts of things, and people are also introducing uh, non-bank-based uh, e-wallets. You know, there's a there's a company that I've seen piloting this on taxi routes. Um, essentially using people's identity number and fingerprints. You don't have to have a bank account. You can, uh, you can pay for your taxi in a cashless, uh, taxi ride in a cashless manner without a bank account. So these things are happening. The, the South African payment system allows for this. We've started to allow non-banks into our payment system a few years ago. Um, and we hope to change the law to allow non-banks into both settlement and clearing. At the moment, they're only in settlement. So I think we've got the architecture to be able to continuously improve our efficiency and lower costs. We've got a lot of work to do. You know, it's still too expensive to transact. Yeah. Um, but but I, I, I don't believe we're being left behind in any way. Okay, so as we wrap this conversation up, Kuben, I've got to ask you, what would your advice be? And I get a sense of what your answer is going to be already, but in your personal capacity, to your child on whether to put his or her cash into crypto, because you've got to admit, it's hard not to be enticed, right? Maybe not at this very moment, given uh, the year to date performance we've seen, but that's been across the board. But it's hard not to be enticed by the kind of returns the space has been enjoying up to this point, you know, when you've got the cost of living, rising inflation, knocking louder and louder on your door. So Alicia, I, I, uh, there's, a, there's a joke, uh, it's a little bit of a mathematical joke about lottery tickets. Uh, they say lottery tickets are a tax. L lottery, the lottery ticket is a tax, right? But it's a tax on those who can't do maths. Right? And it's a progressive tax. In other words, the lower your math scores, the more you pay. Right? And so ve these very high return investments, they, they, they risk, right? I mean, if you want to spend part of your money, go ahead and do it. You know, you could go to the casino and put, you know, all the horse races and put money on a horse. The returns are very high, right? The risks are very high. Um, you know, and, and so my, if you want to spend 5% of your money making, chasing that kinds of returns, you know, be, be my guest. I, I, I don't think that it's a, it's a, I think it's a gamble. Of course, it, you can win. I think it's a gamble. Um, I don't think there's anything that underlies these, these crypto assets in general. Uh, but again, the, the, I think what has changed is the technology. What has changed is the opportunity to disintermediate the banks and to lower costs. And, you know, that could be positive or negative. It's very risky but it could be positive or negative. And I think we're genuinely looking at whether these technologies can help to create a new payment system that's, that's more efficient, that's lower cost. Um, but I, I, I wouldn't, in my individual capacity, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be going to the casino anytime soon. Yeah, because like you say, despite your personal preferences here yeah, or ideas about what this is all about, there's a lot of ifs, there's a lot of mites, there's a lot of possibilities that could be leveraged off a system if used the right way. Kuben, let's leave it there. Thanks so much for having joined us today. And um, it's been an absolute pleasure catching up with you. To our viewers, thank you for having joined us. Remember this view, uh, this webinar will be available via podcast. The series is free, it's shareable, it's open to anyone interested. 
whether you're a PSG client or not. And if you want to keep the conversation going, the social media campaign is hashtag Think Big PSG. So please do engage with us and look out for the next speaker in the Think Big series. For now, from me, Alicia Stephan, it's goodbye.